Joining me now is Democratic Congressman from Massachusetts, Jake Auchincloss. Earlier this year, he introduced legislation to strengthen online privacy protections for children. So thank you so much for being here, Congressman. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Right. Well, I want to get your reaction to the Surgeon General here. Do you believe a tobacco-style warning label will help protect children on these social media platforms? Yes. I think the Surgeon General makes a cogent and compelling case for the warnings, and he also elucidates why we need much more comprehensive regulation of these social media platforms, which have evaded congressional action for the entirety of their existence, and as they have become the most wealthy, the most powerful corporations in human history. It was a timely op-ed right after Father's Day. I'm a young dad, three little kids at home, and I feel like I'm in a race to regulate social media before my oldest kid can start scrolling because we know what it does to adolescent brains, and we know what it does to their socio-emotional development, and we know that these social media corporations are profiting off of the attention spans of our youth. Time for Congress to act. And I wonder, do you think it's fair, as you, as you try to race to, to regulate this, do you think it's fair to compare teen social media use with smoking decades ago? Yes, in that it is a public health emergency that is crystallizing as the evidence becomes uh, more and more irrefutable. Now, are there differences between the two? Obviously, there are. The Surgeon General is leaning into a, uh, an analogy that the American public will find resonant. What is clear, though, is that Congress needs to act and that these social media corporations need to be accountable. So what does that look like? First of all, it looks like raising the age of Internet adulthood. Right now, when you are 13 years old, you're an adult online. Facebook, Instagram, Discord, Reddit, they can treat a 13-year-old as a full-fledged adult. When I tell parents that in my district, they are flabbergasted. That's clearly ridiculous. Needs to be at least 16 years old. We have to help restore the play-based childhood from the grips of the phone-based childhood, and raising the age is an important way to do that. But the second thing we have to do is stop giving these social media corporations immunity from liability. Ever since the 1990s, none of these companies can be sued under Section 230. And so they have no duty of care for the toxicity on their platforms. Hmm. And, and Congressman, you, as well as the Surgeon General, are calling this an emergency. So I wonder, do you have any confidence that Congress can agree to implement warning labels on social media? What are you hearing from your colleagues about implementing this and also a timeline for all of this? Congress hasn't passed a single piece of legislation related to data, to privacy, to algorithms until we led the charge out of the Select Committee on China to divest forcibly TikTok from Chinese, party, Chinese Communist Party control. That, to me, is an important catalyst for taking seriously the imperative to regulate social media. We then saw that the two most senior lawmakers from the Committee of Jurisdiction wrote a bipartisan op-ed in the Wall Street Journal calling for the sunsetting of Section 230, which is this immunity shield for social media corporations. This is progress, but we now have to fill in this forward momentum with substantive policy. That's raising the age, that's getting rid of this liability protection. Yeah, well, th then in that, with that being said, do you really think something's gonna happen here? And also, do you think something more urgent, faster needs to be done? Ultimately, it's gonna take Congress. I I'm heartened to see the uh, state's attorneys general uh, filing a lawsuit collectively against Meta, for example, holding them accountable for harassment of, of young women on their platforms. This is, this is all important. But at the end of the day, you've got trillion dollar corporations and they're up against parents. And it's an unfair fight and it takes an institution like Congress, it takes the force of federal law to truly make a level playing field so that screen time doesn't eat family time. Mm. I want to get your reaction on some news of the day as well. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dissolved his war cabinet earlier today. Your House colleague, Ro Khanna, told Peter Alexander on Meet the Press this Sunday that he won't be attending Netanyahu's address to Congress next month. What's your reaction to that? And is it a mistake by your progressive colleague to, to not go to that address? I'm not going to be taking attendance of, of my colleagues. They, they'll make up their own mind for what's best for them and their districts. What I would say is that Prime Minister Netanyahu needs to focus more on the Knesset and more on his own security cabinet than he does on the United States Congress. The United States Congress has appropriated more than $14 billion in security aid for his efforts in Gaza, which I support in the, uh, in the sense of we have to defeat Hamas and we have to get the hostages home. But the prime minister needs to also wring out consensus from his own government 
about a same-day governance plan for Gaza, because ultimately Hamas cannot be defeated unless there is an alternative. You can't fight something with nothing. Yeah. Uh, are you worried, though, that the war cabinet being dissolved, that it might make it more difficult to rein in Israel's military strategy here and even make it more difficult to get a ceasefire agreement? I do, although it's challenging to predict the vicissitudes of Israeli domestic politics or Middle Eastern dynamics. What I will say is that Prime Minister Netanyahu right now is more dependent upon, prime, upon President Biden than he probably has been over the last three to six months. And that's going to give President Biden more leverage, I think, to get Netanyahu to offer same-day governance strategy for Gaza. Mm. I want to ask you about the Biden campaign. It's focused on courting older voters ahead of November. Um, even if you see some erosion in, in for the Biden campaign for young voters, are you concerned that the president isn't doing enough to really shore up the constitu constituencies that helped him win in 2020? Uh, this election is going to come down to 200,000 voters in six counties. Every vote counts. I'm always skeptical of efforts to slice and dice the electorate and say which one matters more than the other. I think there's a couple of core messages that are going to resonate. One is that President Biden is trying to make this economy work for everybody. If that's older voters, he's talking about Medicare negotiating drug prices and capping out-of-pocket costs at $2,000 per year. Never been done before. Uh, if it's younger voters, he, he might focus more on his efforts to make housing uh, more affordable. But the common theme needs to be cost of living. And then the second one is going to be a contrast on law and order. The Republican Party is trying to defund the FBI, voting against border security. They're nominating a convicted felon. And meanwhile, Joe Biden uh, has put rule of law and his respect for the integrity of the judicial system front and center. Well, we'll certainly be watching that debate uh, in 10 days to, to talk about all the things that you just laid out there. Uh, thank you so much, Congressman, for being here. Good evening. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.